today, as Tony said, is the uh, International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church. I'm not going off course. I just want to quote a statistic. I gave him heart failure back there this morning. I told him I was changing my message, and he had everything all. I felt so sorry for him. I said, no, no, I'll go back to the original. Or I can do both. <laughs> the author of Hebrews says it this way. Remember those in prison as if you were there yourself. Remember also those being mistreated as if you felt their pain in your own bodies. Right now, all around the world, millions of believers are praying for one thing, persecuted Christians. Many of the persecuted Christians are praying right now. In Sudan, Christians are enslaved. The persecution of Christians around the world is more severe now than ever before, mainly because of communism. The 20th century saw more martyrs than the previous 19 centuries combined. In Iran, they're assassinated. In China, they're beaten to death. In more than 60 countries worldwide, Christians are harassed, abused, arrested, tortured, and even executed specifically because of their faith. It's estimated that every five minutes, a Christian is killed for their faith. That means an average of 105,000 believers are killed each year simply for being a Christian. And that means that in the past 10 years, we've seen more than 1 million martyrs worldwide. And I'm here to say to you, a million martyrs is more than enough. We're going to pray for the persecuted church in just a moment. But perhaps nowhere in the world right now is there more persecution religious persecution going on in the Holy Land. Watch this with me. We are living just at the south, very close to the Egyptian and Gaza border. At our area, we were waked up uh, with a strong, very heavy rocket attack. The life was pretty regular before the terrible Sabbath. We ran to the shelter, our shelter inside our house. Mm -hmm. So, and it was so heavy, intense, and long time, long, long time, maybe 20 minutes. <laughs> so it's it's a feeling that you completed the middle of the war. There, there, there were terrorists in our village. The army said that they were hiding there. We cannot get out. Mm -hmm. So you're just closing your home and you hope that they cannot get so I was thinking, if I see terrorists get close to my house, I can go to, to move towards desert or something like this, you know, because even from the Bible, we know if some, there's something, go to the desert, but we cannot because there's a fence around the villages. In our area, we killed 1,300 people, kids and women. It's, it's unbelievable, unbelievable. So, yeah, we were very, very lucky and very blessed from the Lord that he, he, he somehow kept us safe. Kept your life, yeah. yeah. It's horrible. It's in the land, of the holy land of Israel, these terrible things. Ashkelon right now, which is uh, about seven miles from the border with Gaza. This is a place that's been really bombarded with rockets over the last week. We met up with a young man outside of an apartment block that had been hit by a rocket. 
little pieces of the racket, uh, they hit all the windows, see where the holes uh, happened. He was in the middle of the corridor. Yeah. We're with a church that's based here and we had the opportunity to uh, take some boxes of aid to families who have been hunkering down for the past uh, 10 plus days. And a lot of them are too scared to leave their homes even to go to the supermarket. We're very glad that you take care about me and my husband. Thank you very much. A lot of these people are, are in a, a difficult situation right now and it doesn't look like things are going to improve anytime soon. In the last few days we've been in the shelter bomb, mm. just behind here. And um, we've been there for a week now. It's, it's our reality. We hope and we pray that it will change. The work's not done, it's just getting started. So while we were able to meet their needs today, uh, they still need a lot of help for the future. Every $50 you give will help provide a displaced person in the Holy Land with the supplies that they need uh, to survive. Visit worldhelp.net slash holyland to learn more. Five days after the invasion, the world help was on the ground in the Holy Land. We have a partner that we've known for 50 years. His name is Naim Kari. His son, who is Palestinian and lives in the West Bank, is a pastor of a Christian church. And so we have Palestinian ministering to Christians, ministering to the Jewish people, and even among the Muslims. And uh, regardless of the politics, Jesus has commanded us to go and meet those in need. And we're there. And guess what? So are you. Because every $50 you support World Health allows us to help people with those boxes of aid. So when you watch television and see the atrocities, don't wring your hand. Say, thank God for the partnership God put together long before this disaster so we can help. And thank you. Now, did you mean that $4,300 was for world help? Oh, your world help. Well, so we're going to help people, right? Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Would you stand with me? Right now, we're going to join millions of Christians around the world. Pastor Mark, would you come, please, and voice our prayer? And let's pray for the persecuted church. Heavenly Father, you are always good. Father, help us to focus on what is unseen and eternal. Help us to have eternal vision, Lord. This world isn't heaven, but that's not an excuse just to wait for heaven, Lord. This world is an opportunity for your people who are called by your name to reach out, to bear one another's burdens, to redeem this earth, Lord, in your name, in Jesus' name. So, Lord, we come before you today lifting up the persecuted church. We thank you for the opportunity we have here in America to worship you however we see fit, according to your word and your will. We don't realize how easy we have it, Father. Help us open our eyes, open our hearts, open our minds for those around the world who are being persecuted because of your word, Lord. We pray for freedom. Your kingdom is about setting captives free, Lord, and the persecuted church is captive. We are your ambassadors as though you were making your appeal directly through us, Lord. Help us to be true ambassadors. 
Help us to step out in our gifting, whatever it is. If it's to go, we go. If it's to serve, we serve. If it's to give, we give. If it's to pray, we pray. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. The persecuted church is persecuted by the enemy. Lord, send an army of angels and send an army of your people to stand up against this persecution. Holy Spirit, fall in such a heavy way on the holy land. I pray, Lord, you've got it. <laughs> we know you've got it. You win. Help those in the middle of the battle now, Lord. Bring them peace. Bring them safety. Bring them healing. Help us to be your agents of change. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. You may be seated. I overheard my grandchildren talking last week about the atrocities they've seen on television, and they summed up in one sentence my uh, theology on what is happening in, in the Middle East right now. And one of my grandchildren said, why, why should we care about what happens in Israel? And the other little grandchildren said, because they're God's chosen people. Full stop. So let's pray. And as you watch it on television, remember that you've already sent aid that's already being delivered to help people stay alive. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. The Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 15, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad we have a God of hope this morning? So that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. The words of C.S. Lewis, when he's talking about pain, and there are a lot of people in pain today. He said, God whispers to us in our pleasures. He speaks in our conscience, but he shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Tony told you about me facing cancer. The doctor said, go home, put your affairs in order. You're probably not going to survive. If you do, you'll never preach again. They removed a five pound tumor from off my heart and lungs. They removed a third of my lung. They Paralyzed my diaphragm, and for two years I couldn't speak. And uh, the most frustrating thing ever in my life. And they said if they'd waited another week, it would have been too late. They uh, started the chemotherapy, and midway through the chemotherapy, it leaked and caused a chemical burn, and they had to sew my hand to my side and leave it attached for a month so the blood vessels could attach. I had to go out and buy size 50 waist pants just to go to the doctor and everybody was laughing at me. I mean, imagine a grown man with his hand stuck down the front of his pants and he can't talk. It was, you have to have a sense of humor. But uh, I'll never forget the day the doctor said, you are now in remission. And about 10 years ago, I'll never forget the day after semi-annual chest x-rays and checkups, they said, you don't need to come back anymore. You are healed. Aren't you glad doctors are sometimes wrong? You know, 
when I was enduring cancer, world health hadn't even started yet. And I thought my life was over. And little did I realize that the greatest work that God had for me to do hadn't even started yet. I soon came to believe that God was going to do incredible things through this trial in my life. But he had to teach me some things about myself. I believed he was going to heal me. I believed he was going to use my struggles to change life. I just didn't know how, but God did. World health wasn't even on my radar. I had no idea that God would use my greatest struggle, my greatest trial, to help others through their greatest struggles and their greatest trials. And today, I realize that there may be people in this room right now going through struggles and going through trials. You may have even lost all hope. You may be sitting here paralyzed with pain, whether physical or emotional. And and I, I tell you, emotional pain is more painful because you can take a pill for physical pain. Hope. This is our mission. If we hope to be shapers of the future, the greatest mission we face as God's men and women is to see ourselves as agents of hope. God has called us to be agents of hope. Those boxes of aid that our team delivered to those Christians being persecuted by bombs and invasion Those were boxes of hope. And in the face of hopelessness, in the face of persecution around the world, I want to challenge us this morning to be agents of hope. As a cancer survivor, when I came out of cancer, I developed a new motto for my life, Mark. I I said that every day, I try to live my life in such a way that I accomplish at least one thing that will outlive me and last for eternity. And I pray that what I'm doing right now is that one thing for today. Challenging you to be agents of hope. I want to be a giver of hope. God wants you to be a giver of hope. Hope in the Bible is the calm assurance that God is in control, a peaceful promise that God is faithful, an unwavering belief that God will accomplish His his purposes even when we don't see a way. No matter how grim the statistics, no, no matter how hopeless the situation no matter how bad the violence gets in our culture or the terrorism gets in our world today, Jesus Christ loves people and they can change. Jesus Christ is the hope of the world. Do you believe that? The local church is the hope of the world. Do you believe that? then the local church is the hope of Toronto. Why is this church here? Why are you here? I believe with all my heart you are here because God wants you to be an agent of hope to those in this city that need it. Hope in the Bible is the calm assurance that God is in control. Tony and I were in a refugee camp in Iraq. 50,000, 80,000 refugees living in tents in the winter. 
many of them had been driven out of Mosul. As I listened to their stories, I realized that the people in the Middle East are losing hope. And I cannot relate to being brutally persecuted for my faith. I don't even pretend to know the kind of suffering they endure. But as the body of Christ, we are all part of the same family. If one part hurts, we all hurt. If we truly understand this truth, that underneath a conflict obscured by politics and fear, are people who desperately need our help. We will move beyond guilt and pity and start practicing an authentic brand of compassion, one that actively meets people where they are instead of simply hoping that someone else will do the job. Recently, while we were in that refugee camp, I saw a man hurrying toward me carrying a baby in his arms and he kept pleading with me to do something but I couldn't understand him and when he finally reached me he began to push the baby into my arms repeating the same words over and over I quickly learned that his wife had been killed by ISIS and that he was afraid his baby was dying and he wanted me to take her so her life might be spared was trying to give me his own daughter. He was hopeless. I stood there stunned and silently prayed, Dear God, this man has just lost his wife. He's about to lose his baby too. He would rather give her to me, a total stranger, than risk her dying in his arms. He has lost all hope and I realized that God had me there not just to oversee the aid that we were delivering but God had me there as an agent of hope millions of people are living in persecuted countries and staring in the face of death uncertainty Hopelessness. I believe that defines the Middle East today. You said, what happened to that baby? I told the man I could not, for legal reasons, I could not take his baby. But we got him hooked up with our uh, leadership in that camp. And we made sure he got the medical treatment he needed. And we made sure that he got the food that he needed. And he made sure we, he had someone to talk to. And we basically gave that man a huge dose of hope. So the question today is, will you, will we be the ones to say enough and give the world hope? Today I want, I want you to think about one question that I've asked myself many times during this invasion in Israel, the pandemic around the world, ISIS. A question that's a uh, foundation to all the work that Jesus has commanded us to do. And it's this. Why is hope so important? What are you willing to do to bring hope to people who are hurting? Giving those Israelis that food wasn't just meeting a physical need, we were giving them hope. We hear the word hope used in all sorts of ways. We hear it used in cliches and expressions of wishful thinking. 
like I hope Ohio State wins. We hear it used to describe a sense of expectancy or waiting, but seldom do we focus on what the word hope means and why hope matters. Leslie Newbigin was a missionary to India, and he had quite a bit of contact with hopeless situations. He says in his book, The Gospel in a Pluralistic Society, that the distinguishing mark of the Christian community is hope. That's who we are. That's what we do. That's why the body of Christ exists. That's what makes us different. That's what characterizes what we do. A hope in a God who can do anything. We can hope in the fact that he is sovereign over everything, but chooses to use human beings as his agents of hope. We must believe in a hope that can penetrate hearts and change lives in a way that nothing else can. A hope that has no boundaries. A hope that can overcome any obstacle. A hope for you in your time of sorrow and worry as you face a difficult situation or an uncertain future. The kind of hope that accomplishes the impossible. That's why hope, by definition, is the very essence of the gospel. Hope changes everything. And I want to remind us, as long as there is a God, there is hope. As long as you and I can work to bring about that hope, whether by a cup of cold water or a box of life-giving food or an open Bible given in Jesus' name, we must try. Mark, I often get asked the question, what should we do? Just preach the gospel or just give them the aid they need to stay alive? And I say the answer is both. We're called, we're called to meet the physical needs and the spiritual needs of hurting people around the world. I'm reminded of the quote attributed to St. Francis of Assisi when he said, preach the gospel at all times and when necessary, use words. Wouldn't it be something if this church would be known in this community as a center of hope, filled with agents of hope. May our greatest desire be that we are the hands and feet of Jesus on the ground for the helpless and the hurting. That's why hope's so important. That's why you are so important to what God is doing around the world. It's not what world help is doing. It's what we're doing together. And I'm asking you to leave this place today with a renewed sense of your mission that you will be an agent of change, that you'll be able to say these words. I know the plans that I have for you, says God. Plans for welfare and not calamity, for a new life and not destruction to give you a future, and to give you hope. I pray that God will continue to use each one of us to do something that will outlive us and last for eternity. And I pray that God today will whisper hope in your ear. My grandchildren asked me years from now, Poppy, what did you do? to help those persecuted people in the Holy Land. I want to be able to tell them I gave them hope. We gave them hope. What will you tell your children and grandchildren that you brought hope to thousands of Christ followers when they needed it the most? 
a few months ago, Tony and I were in Cuba meeting with our dedicated network of church planters there. Twenty years ago, I would have never dreamed of what I saw. On that very first trip, I was so discouraged. We were detained for three hours. The spiritual needs of the Cuban people were so great. There was virtually no training for church planters, no networks, no reliable foundations to build on. Now, nearly two decades after our work began, we are seeing an incredible harvest in Cuba. And today we support a network of over 200 Cuban church planters who are changing the island nation with the good news of the gospel. These courageous men with our help and women and training and support have helped establish 3,700 house churches in Cuba with over 150,000 Christ followers. That's hope in the middle of a communist government. And it's happening all over the world today. So may I remind you once more that our greatest desire should be that we are the hands and feet of Jesus on the ground to the helpless and hurting. That's why hope is so important. That's why you are so important to the helpless and hurting and to what God is doing around the world. That's why what we are doing here this week is important. This is kingdom work. So will you choose to be an agent of hope? Not only to the churches of North America, the first responders in this community, but to a world that desperately needs hope. Will you be a hope giver to someone who has lost all hope? It's, a, it's about more than just programs. It's about people. And I pray with all of my heart that God would continue to use each one of you to do something that will outlive you and last for eternity. Because in essence, it's all about hope. A hope that can change the world. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you for letting us be your partner. And God bless what we're going to do together. Thank you.